a lot of times you're going to make a movie about something you personally love, but maybe not everybody else in the world loves it. How do you make it relatable? How do you make something that you find really interesting universal? And how do you sell it? I'm George Edelman, host of the No Film School podcast, editor-in-chief at No Film School. And my guest today is John Weinbach, who directed the new Netflix documentary, The Redeem Team. And look, I love basketball. I love Kobe Bryant. I love LeBron James. This is a documentary that I would have watched no matter what. (laughs) But when you make a documentary this size for a company like Netflix, and you're someone like John, who has an extremely successful track record producing and directing docs, sports docs, being in journalism in general, you have to learn how to make these things, not just for the people who already want to see it, like me or even like him, but for people who have no interest in that topic or minimal interest and are there for the story. That's a big part of good documentary filmmaking. And it's actually a big part of all filmmaking. And John takes us through his career, talks about all the things he's learned and how he got where he is, but also specifically how to do this. And there are some great interview tips in here that I hope I remember because I interview people a lot for this podcast, but I also just think are super valuable. His insights into this process are gold. Like uh, the Olympics. Hey, there we go. All right. So here we are. John Weinbach, the Redeem Team. John, it's so great to talk to you. It's this movie is so exciting. Uh, and you, the things you've worked on already are awesome. Um, I want to talk about, uh, documentary filmmaking and sort of finding like how you find a narrative and how you found your way into this career. And at some point, I also just want to talk about all this cool stuff you've told stories about, because these are my these are my legends and myths. So, so, and you're, you've been a big part of making them and building them. Um, but yeah, just tell me a little bit about getting into documentary filmmaking. Like, how did you find a way in? Um, so the, the, the short, long story or the long, short story is, so I was a, a journalist. I was a reporter with the Wall Street Journal um, on, uh, out of college. And I was, you know, uh, always sort of obsessed with, you know, sports and sports media. And I, I blame slash credit my dad um, just because he got the LA Times and the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. And I, you know, figured out early on, he was like reading the paper early in the mornings. And that's how I connected with sports. You know, LA is was sort of in a certain kind of way behind the Times because you could not watch home games uh, for the Dodgers. Uh, and we didn't get cable till relatively later. So you couldn't watch home games at the Lakers. <laughs> I used to listen. You still, on the- sometimes you still can't, by the yeah, way, exactly. for either yeah, no. now. Yeah, so, uh, I used to listen to games on the radio and, you know, I grew up an LA sports fanatic in the eighties, which I submit greatest time to be alive as a sports fan, you know, uh, growing up. Yeah. The Boston people have, have a claim over the last 20 years, but I think LA in the eighties with five Lakers championships, uh, two Dodgers championships, uh, the Raiders won a Super Bowl, the Olympics in 1984, the birth of what we now know now as the sort of X Games culture of skateboards and 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 surfing and and all that. You know, volleyball was incredible. Oh, by the way, there were basically I, two two college football programs, USC and UCLA, that won. I don't know how. I think UCLA won seven straight bowl games in the eighties. So, <laughs> I'm, you know. I'm laughing because I didn't know you were from LA. I'm from LA and I grew up in the eighties, so I, so I know what you're talking about. Um, but yes, no, I just no. think, and and that's just on the sports side and on the media side. We had Vince Scully, we had Chick Hearn, we had Bob Miller of the Kings, we had Dick Enberg. Um, and you had, you know, the LA times sports section who I'm, I'm very proud to showcase Bill Plaschke in the film. Um, you know, Bill Plaschke, Jim Murray, Mike Downey, Steve Springer, Scott Osler. I mean, these are like, for me, I'm a you know big journalism geek and I, these are bylines that were like, you know, legends to me. So all of that combined got me in, interested in the media world. And in terms of documentaries, you know, it was a transformational thing for me. Um, two films, I would say, um, got me into it was, um, one day in September, uh, which was the the film by Kevin McDonald about the, uh, 1972 Munich, uh, Olympics and the the massacre of the Israeli athletes. 
And, um, you know, I'm, I, I grew up going to Jewish day school. I have a lot of family in Israel, sports, politics, history, Israel. This were like all of the things that, you know, got me engaged and how you could combine music and video and testimony together. And then also similar, I mean, different, totally different kind of project, but Dogtown and Z boys. Yes. Um, I remember that. Yes. <laughs> and you know, um, it's so great. And I was just like, that's the medium I should be working in or I, 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 something about it. And I had had the opportunity, my, I sort of lost my virginity in production uh, on a show called um, the life for ESPN uh, in 2001. And, and I had a chance to kind of come in at like, I was employed, the first employee, really uh, Jamie Patrickoff with whom I've had a wonderful relationship personally and professionally was the executive producer of that. Um, and we kind of, th- th- we were all babies trying to do this show, 32 episodes for ESPN and the diaspora from that, group of people uh, who did that show is pretty remarkable. I mean, Jamie's had a wonderful career. Matt Ogans, who's one of the directors, is an Academy Award nominee. Rich Kleiman did our music, who's now the you know partner of Kevin Durant. Mike Warren is a great director who is an editor. Ting Poo is an Academy Award nominated uh, editor who was an editor for us. So, um, so all those relationships probably feed into everything you do now too, right? Like yeah, just staying so, connected and... Yeah, and so I, I feel very lucky. I love what I do and I get to you know, use sports to tell stories about the human condition. And, you know, at a time when, especially now, everything's so divisive and uh, open to interpretation on the political realm. And I think sports is a unifying force. So um, that's kind of how I got into it. And, you know, I'm, I'm definitely like a, a child of the 30 for 30 group connor shell what am i talking about? connor shell was on our espn the live team he was he technically worked for me i mean we were all the same age but you know he's obviously gone on to do great things and so uh and is a great friend and so um you know i had a, the opportunity to, to do it in one of the first 30 for 30s working with ice cube on the raiders and and the sort of the the, the birth of nwa and west coast gangster rap and and, and so that's kind of how I, that's how I got to know Mike Tolan was through the 30 for 30 series with whom I had, you know, wonderful partnership for the last nine years, and, you know, he's the EP on this show. So, um, talking about 30 for 30 is an interesting segue real quick, because I feel like 30 for 30 in a lot of ways has sort of defined the modern concept of the sports doc, because it just created these like, Hey, there's all these amazing little things that have happened in like, you know, you mentioned September, uh, I forget what it's called, but the uh, one day in September. Night- yeah, that's a classic Dogtown Z Boys. Like growing up, there were a handful uh, in an age range where you were like, and then Hoop Dreams came along. You know, there are these like kind of seminal sports film stocks. Um, and, and the big thing is like a sports doc takes, because we know we lived it, right? So the sports doc does so much more than the fictional sports movie for us because we're like, yeah, I lived it. Now show me more or take me behind. But 30 for 30 started to be like, there's so many more little things you don't know. Like, even if you love sports and I think it just blew up from there. So can you tell yeah. me a little bit about like what you, where, where that, like, cause you've been, you've been on this journey with sports docs as they've expanded and exploded. Right. Yeah. No, no question. I mean, look, we're probably in a, if we're in a golden age of television and content generally, specifically, you know, you know the last 15, uh, 2008, 2009, I think the lot, the, the, 30 for 30 series was actually launched in 2009. Um, but yeah, it's absolutely a golden age of sports storytelling. Um, and, you know, the 30 for 30 series is, I don't know that you can quantify it. I mean, it's an enormous thing. And so it birthed careers for so many great, you know, people and it shined a light on, you know, these the human stories. And you're right. I mean, it was really the occasional doc won a year from HBO yeah. and they did a great job, but it was sort of yeah. like, man. And it also like the, you know, the nonfiction storytelling world was not really viewed as a commercially viable thing right. because there was no outlet. And I mean, you know, our partners here at Netflix made it possible. Yes. I mean, I would say that sort of seminal things are the 30 for 30 series. OJ. Uh, your name is George Edelman, so I went to college with Ezra Edelman. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I'm not related, but that thing, related. that's that thing's incredible, by the way. <laughs> so what 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 the OJ series did is it said, oh, yeah, it can work multi part, you know. And so that thing, the Last Dance, obviously, is an enormous thing because it shows this can be global. It can transfix everyone, 
and obviously that's a very specific set of circumstances with a very specific kind of story, but, um, you know, all of those things I think combined, but, but no question the, the, the 30 for 30 series kind of showed. Yeah. It was big, big moment in the history of the medium. So tell me about last dance, last dance, like blew this thing wide open. Like, yeah. like, I feel like Last Dance was a was a phenomenon in an event, and it was kind of crazy to me. Again, we lived it. Like, I, I watched all that stuff happen, but it was kind of crazy to me that, one, wow, a lot of people had no idea, because I guess it was a pretty long time ago, and two, just, like, getting all this additional stuff. Like, tell me about working on that and just, like, the, the what, where, how did it all came together and, like, what it takes to mount and put together something like that. Like, cause it's, you know, it was, everybody stopped and watched it, you know, it just felt like the world stopped and watched it, you know, at least the yeah, sports I mean, world. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, listen, it, it's, it's a unicorn in so many different ways. Um, but you know, this, the footage, you know, the 500 hours of, of footage, the, the film footage that was shot by the NBA mm-hmm. uh, during that last season, that, that asset had been this kind of, uh, you know, White holy whale. whale. Were, okay, footage. yeah. And and I had heard about it actually as far back as 2001 when um, we were shooting on the life um, because uh. one of one of the camera guys we used had 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 worked at the NBA. And he's like, you know, John, there's this great footage of of you know Jordan in the last <laughs> season. And remember, at that point, Jordan had come back with <laughs> right with wizards, and so um, and it had been sort of a reapproach and reapproached and you know um we sort of became it was a whole bunch of factors but sort of gotten connected with it with sd portnoy who you know has worked with michael for many many years um and so then you know mike tolan and i i think we've met with sd 2015 uh at the all-star game in I can't remember if it was, oh, it was Toronto, bitterly cold. And so, I mean, it was a long process, you know, trust building and, you know. Putting it together because, yeah, there's. Put together this sort of pitch book. And then, you know, Mike had written this great note in the pitch book and then went to meet personally with Michael. And we got the okay to do it in 2016 and uh, initially, and then sort of struck the deal in 2017 and then brought on Jason Hare and, you know, and the, and these great producers and all that stuff, um, in 2018. And so, you know, long process. Uh, it's such a process. Is yeah. that just like, because you're dealing with, you know, one of the biggest global icons ever. So yeah, I mean, like, and, and then you have to also like one of the most exciting things about that doc, you're talking about the pieces coming together is that you guys didn't just get Michael to sign off. You got, Scotty Pippen, you got Phil Jackson, you got Dennis Rodman, and then you notoriously not Steve for very Burr long. And everyone, I mean, I right. think that, you got everybody. Uh, the look, the the team did an incredible job. Jason did a masterful job on the interviews. The editors did an incredible job. You know, it was two great producers, uh, three great producers: uh, uh, Jake Rogal, Matt Maxson, and I. You know, a woman named Mina Kristich, who's just you know top, top, top archival producer. She had been the archival producer on on the OJ series. Great support from ESPN support from netflix the nba um hard a lot of people involved um but and ultimately really incredible interviews with with everyone but particularly Mm -hmm. i mean i have lots of little moments i really love i mean i you know obviously the michael interviews the jason's device of using the 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 ipod and and the phone to fascinating tool that device. yeah i mean you know it's not look it's not that i don't know that it was the only time it's been done it's just it was so meaningful to see it with michael and you see the kind of the, the twinkle in his eye when he watches it um and I, you know i can tell you the first time i saw that it was like oh man <laughs> that's gonna be so awesome and that was you know um but it also came together I mean, in terms of the actual production and and when it was going to air and you know who could have predicted the pandemic and then right to, right and to, to distribute it in the way it was distributed and and look you know I think the project would have been enormously successful. I would like to think so regardless. It was very well done. I'm enormously proud to have been part of it. Um, I think when it dropped, specifically even yeah. within the pandemic, when it yes. dropped, when it dropped <laughs> at, at the moment of sort of greatest insanity, 
where we not only we forget about there was nothing going on in the sports world, there was nothing happening. We couldn't leave our houses. <laughs> yeah, and, and all all you had was a drumbeat yeah. of fear, and and yeah. I mean fear, real fear. I mean a drumbeat of fear and insanity and un, uh, uncertainty. And it was like okay, for five weeks, for two hours on a Sunday, like that all goes away, and we can live in that. And so. That's a really unique set of circumstances. The greatest, most iconic athlete of our time, maybe of all time, being super candid. And, you know, and also, you know, it, it, one of the things that I don't think gets enough credit, in addition to the team that made it possible, um, is the story, right? Because <laughs> that, they, that this footage existed on its own would be great. But yeah. think about it. They decided to destroy a, a, a dynasty. Nobody does that. <laughs> you know, so yeah. she had this great internal clock where it really, everybody knew it was the last season and very unusual. So yeah. um, all of those factors, you know. Yeah. I mean, and I, I, I want to get to Redeem Team now because um, there's so many things we could keep talking about, about coming up and making docs, but you, you directed Redeem Team. And you're dealing with equally massive legends, um, really. Like, I mean, just LeBron James and Kobe Bryant. Like, I, I mean, and Michael Jordan, they're all three, like, these just massive, massive legends. And you're also dealing with this factor of, of Kobe and his untimely tragic passing. And he kind of, he, he hangs over this thing, like, in this kind of magical, mystical way. He hangs over everything now, it seems like, in basketball. But, like... And, and and there's so many, there's like the birth of these, some of these guys, their identities, there's the fact that this is the Olympics and it's a whole other story uh, with that than pro than the regular pro sports stuff. Can you talk about putting the pieces together to make this? And like, you, just like you kind of explained, like, Hey, you know, I knew the footage existed with last dance. We had like this kind of treasure chest to build it around. Um, what's the, what's the kind of, birth story, the origin story for Redeemed? Uh, you know, the, the long, short story, the short, long story is that, um, you know, so I'm now the president of Skydance Sports the last year or so, but we had, um, for the last nine, previous nine years, I was with Mike Tolan and, uh, at, at Manly Sports Media, a wonderful partnership. And we had, uh, we were brought in by Frank Marshall, uh, another giant, um, <laughs> this, um, sort of a 30 for 30-esque sort of premium storytelling around the Olympics and had this unique partnership with the IOC. And we had done, I can't remember the number of films at that point, I think maybe seven films we had completed by 2019, late 19, we wanted an American story. And the, the, the sort of originating event, I give the credit to my, my former colleague, great friend, and who's a co-producer on the film, Jonathan Vogler. And you know, we were shooting the, you know what, in the office and he just comes in and he goes, 2008 gold medal game, USA, Spain, one of the five greatest games ever played. I was like, strong, strong. Yeah, that's I, a take. I love it. I love it. And, and so, and you know, I'm a junkie of basketball, you know, to an embarrassing degree. And I was like, Me you too. know, <laughs> you're not wrong. And, yeah. you know, it's weird. Has there not been a film about it? And, and so we, you know, we start Googling and doing and, and like, wait, there was some, this, there was a project done in 2008 um, by the NBA that was sort of a lead up to the Olympics, but it didn't have the Olympic footage. And it obviously, it was just sort of, the, this is how they got there. We were like, oh my God, it was, you know, how YouTube is. It's like in 17 different parts. And, and um, so, well, hey, let's, let's, let's go for this. And that was really the origin story of it. And, and, um, the, and, and so shortly thereafter, you know, as part of this Olympic series, we wanted to get, if not the you know, executive producer or director or whatever, actually the participation of Olympians, clearly. And so uh, one of the, we focused in on is, and I, we had talked about, Jonathan and I were talking about, it, I was like, you know, I, as great as that team was like, people don't really remember how great D. Wade was in that final. And really through that whole Olympics. And so we went to Dwayne um, and he was incredible. He was enthusiastic. He was positive. He was sort of really excited because, you know, one of, you mentioned about footage, Olympic footage is very challenging. You know, if you're not to, to get, it's expensive. Um, and so that was one of the, I mean, just a total massive asset was having unfettered access to the Olympic footage. Yeah. And when we knew that there was, you know, again, had the great pleasure of working with the NBA. And I mean, that, uh, 
sort of countless projects, not countless, but a lot of projects in my career. And once I saw that, hey, this stuff exists on YouTube, hey, let's, let's talk to the NBA. And so they were really wonderful about you know helping us navigate through that. And um, that's how it kind of got started. And Dwayne Wade was the first kind of chip. Right. I'm sorry. So he was right. So he came on as executive producer. That kind of gave the project jet fuel in terms of getting it, hey, approved um, from the IOC. And uh, and then we were sort of off to the races in basically January of 2020 is when we kind of really launched production. And you started working on, you know, getting the interviews. Tell me about how you pieced together. When, you know, you, you know, you're going to try to interview everybody, I'm sure. And you know, you have X amount of footage. When do you sort of discover, like you said, the last dance had a narrative? When do you discover the narrative well, and what it, you know? Look, I was, you know, I mentioned I, I used to be a reporter. And so I, I sort of view every project through that lens of how we used to propose stories when I was at the Wall Street Journal, which you had to do. I mean, oftentimes the proposal process was like harder than the actual article. Um, and it's like, okay, here's the overview. How do we make it more about that than more than just basketball? What are the human stories we're trying to feather in and how can we have a sort of specific arc of whether it's redemption or defeat or whatever for, for as many people as possible? Because that's what, you know, I, my reason for being is, is kind of like, hey, using sports to tell stories about the human condition or using sports to tell stories about humans. Um, yeah. And so, um, and so, you know, there were a couple that were clear, you know, sort of obviously on the basketball of it all. I think I certainly didn't know the extent when we started of like for Dwayne, you know, that he really was, you know, I, it seems, oh God, of course you'd have Dwayne win on the Olympic team. It wasn't so clear he was going to be on the team because he was injured and, yeah. and the heat were terrible, you know, and he was kind of, it was after Shaq had left and the heat were literally the worst team in the league. And it was kind of like, yeah, what happened to D Wade? You know, and so, and that was a great redemption story. And obviously, you know, LeBron was a different guy in 2004, four, five, six. You could not won an NBA championship. And, you know, Mellow was sort of regarded as mellow and selfish and what have you. And even Coach K, you know, it seems so obvious now, given the success. It was not obvious at all. Like, well, I would have the college coach do it, you know? And Coach K, you know, this is, you know, you have the, you can only get so much into the to the film, but Coach K had actually been, little known fact, had been the USA national team coach. Between the Seoul Olympics, when we still had college players, it was coached by John Thompson, and the Barcelona Olympics, the dream team was coached by Coach uh, Chuck Daly. Yeah. There was a period where there was one other national team that, huh. was coach, that had college players. It was in 1990. Coach K was the coach of that team. Wow. You don't remember it because we lost. <laughs> the world championships to, to I believe Yugoslavia. We lost at the Goodwill Games. People don't remember the Goodwill Games. That was Ted Turner's attempt to have an Olympics. We lost to the Soviet Union. We lost to Yugoslavia. And by the way, it was a pretty good team. It had Larry Johnson, it had Kenny Anderson, it had yeah, Lonzo Morgan. But it had, it had good Goodwill college players at the time, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Coach K was very much stung by that. He was like, I'm never uh, going to get a chance to coach the national team. So uh, you know, there was a real question. That's one of my favorite sections in our film of, you know, what did, what did LeBron think about that? What did Carmelo think about that? And I love what LeBron says. He was, he, we hated Duke. You know, <laughs> it's like, he's not like anybody else. So, so there was a real question about that. And so that's uh, that long way of answering your question is like, try to identify, we knew we had the basketball story, right? Right. Which had its own drama. And I knew it was going to end it. We knew it ends in a super dramatic game, right? But then what are the things we can feather in? The players, the coach, Colangelo, and, the, you know, the Doug Collins connectivity. Mm. And so, you know, all of those things, it's like, okay, we got some material here to work with. How do we feather in those stories? How do we feather in the footage? <clears throat> and how do we make it move so that, you know, it's not like a Wikipedia entry? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Like, because to me, it would have been interesting no matter what. But I wonder about, like, you create the human, like you said, elements where you're trying to say, like, this isn't just a story about superhumans doing an amazing thing. This is a story about regular people facing the kinds of challenges that are, you know, real and relatable. Um, there are, it's easy for people to forget that all those guys outside of Kobe were kind of like, they're not winners yet, 
right? Because now they're all winners, right? <laughs> but at that time, they weren't seen that yeah, way. So that's one, yeah. The old uh, uh, D Wade had one championship, yeah. and Kobe. But but aside from D Wade, until Kobe comes in, none of them had won anything. Nothing. Yeah, I mean, not even close. It's, in, it's in kind of crazy, especially and thinking Car- about Carmelo LeBron. Had, yeah, and Carmelo had won a championship in college, right. but. You know, Chris Paul yeah. had won nothing. You know, Darren Williams had won nothing. Dwight Howard had won nothing. Chris Bosh had won nothing. I mean, these guys have not been champions. Yeah. And uh, yeah, just there's so much there. Just so for me, it was 2008. The Lakers had just lost to the Celtics. I was like, I can't watch basketball right now. I was in mourning. So this doc for me was amazing because I was like, I can relive it now comfortably. But at the, that summer, I was like, I can't. I can't do this. It's mm-hmm. too painful. Um, tell me a little bit about interviews with people like this, like creating a context where you know they're going to be comfortable, where you have an idea of what you want to get, where like documentary interview techniques, but also with, you know, people who are super, I mean, you've been doing this a while. So, you know, but if you can kind of get into the mindset a little bit of like, they are intimidating, they would be intimidating to most of us to interview, you know, like kind of what's your strategy and and what do you go in thinking about and how do you set up, you know, like, Here's what yeah, we want to get, you know, those sure. things. No, and you have the other issue of, you know, some limited time in, in cases. Um, I think, look, I, I, I probably came come to documentaries with a little bit of an advantage having been a reporter. So some of the right. um, fear and, you know, the 10,000 hours of it all, you know, having been an interviewer a lot and cold calling people and all that stuff, um, a little bit less. But um I think the big thing is, look, you've got to be prepared. You've got to know what are the things you would like to hear, almost an ideal script in your head. Um, but I think, look, I, be partially because of my own basketball fandom, I, I think that that I, I, I know what I was talking about. And, and so, like, it, I think that that helps a little bit in terms of, you know, with these guys. Because oftentimes, you know, they're, it's very easy for them to give canned answers. But the, the truth is, you know, it's all subject to, to whoever your subject is. And I was just sort of blown away. I don't know, blown away is the wrong word. I was just, it was just so rewarding to see the grace, the candor, the humor, um, the genuine affection for talking about this, even about the bad stuff um, from everyone. Um, and I would say, I mean, this is like picking babies, but like the, 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 the interviews with Dwayne, Carmelo, who I think people were really going to love in the film. Carlos Boozer was fabulous. And LeBron and Coach yeah. K, yeah. All, all, all five of them, but really everyone, were, were career highlights for me, for sure. Wow. That's saying a lot, given all that you've done. Um, you bring up another really good point, though. Like, even as with the reporting history, these guys are very used to doing interviews Mm -hmm. and being super careful. They're very good at it and they should be, right? It's an important part of their job. Um, And they're very skilled and they do this. They do it every day. They do it all the time. They do it when their brain is tired and their body is exhausted. So you're coming into a situation with limited time and you're trying to get some more of that loose story, you know, like just comfortability and like tell me a story or talk about things in an emotional way or a human way. Uh, and you sort of hinted at breaking down a little bit by like, Hey, I like, I, we can talk basketball, right? Like, but is there other elements to getting I that mean, kind I, of like out of the. Yeah. I mean, look, everybody has their own technique. Some interviewers, some documentary directors are quite reserved and, and it works for them because look, I sat next to a, uh, uh, a woman at the Wall Street Journal named Alex Friedman who won, I don't know, two or three uh, Pulitzer Prizes, among others, for her work on the tobacco, you know, uh, yeah. uh, cases, um, big, taking on big tobacco. And she had a thing that I stole. And, and she would say, you got to explain this to me like I'm an idiot. Ah. So, explain this to me. Because, like, and so my, I, what I do, I was like, look, for my mom, who may know <laughs> nothing about this, how, what is the significance of this? So it just, it gets them thinking about it, the interview subject, whether whoever it is, about, hey, I got to explain this in sort of a way that's not just for a basketball fan. And that's really my whole way of doing these things. Is like, okay, 
can someone who doesn't know anything about this connect to it? So there's a broader audience. Obviously, you're going to be in just on the basketball, but but you know that's not the audience for Netflix. That's not the audience I try to go for. I mean, it is obviously. We sure, give all that. but you got us already, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so you know, I think you know that's sort of a little thing. I think authenticity. I think. For me, I can't be there. Some, like I was saying, there's some who are very reserved and they let these sort of pregnant, almost uncomfortable pauses happen. And mm. the, sometimes, doesn't happen all the time. When you do that, the, 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 sub, the interview subject is like uncomfortable and just starts talking to fill the time. And that works mm. for some people. Mm. It's not my approach. I like to bring energy to the interview, especially with athletes, because of exactly what you just said. They're so used to 17 people, you know. Tell me about the game, you know, the third quarter, you know? And so <laughs> like, what happened on that seven to two run turn the game? It's like, you know, they can only answer that question so many times. And so <laughs> I like to, to bring some new energy to it and you hope for the best. I like that you highlight that there's different ways. They work for different people for different situations. Cause it's true about like everything basically, but you make, that's such a great tip because, um, you make a doc about something that interests you that you love, but you want to make it for people past just those who love it because you're telling a story. You're bringing it to more people. And that's sort of like, how do you open it up? Like, how do I tell my wife who likes basketball? Fine. But like, we got to watch the Redeem Team doc. It's going to be great. It's like, it's just about basketball. Like, no, no. Right. Like, yeah, it's got to be about more. It's, it's Netflix. Yeah. So when you pitch, do you talk about that stuff? Yeah. yeah so sure. Tell me about oh, the pitching bad. a little bit. The pitching, in this case, to Netflix? Yeah, just like pitching well, once. Yeah, this is a little unusual, our experience here, because the commissioning uh, uh, executive at Netflix, Dan Silver, is, is I've known for more than 10 years. And, and he, he's uniquely positioned to understand this story. He knew it. He Got it. More but I think, yeah, I mean, I think the idea is, hey, this Project X, whatever it is, we've got to have something that makes it you know, undeniable, interesting, broad, broadly appealing. And so that can be access, that can be footage, that can be the talent that you bring to bear on the project, whether it's the director or the producer or whomever. Ideally, it's all of those things. So, you know, I, I think that, um, yeah, you, for, the, for the premium players, whether, you know, Netflix, Apple, Amazon, I don't know if I'm allowed to say the other competitors, but like, you know, <laughs> um, for, for Netflix, clearly that bar is super high. So um, that's always in my thinking. And in that way, I actually do think I, I was well prepared because I, my journalism career, I was doing sports and sports business for what, you know, is a primarily business newspaper. So yeah. it had to clear uh, the bar of, yes. okay, this isn't the Sports Illustrated piece. And I had, you know, editors who were wonderful to me, but who didn't know, who knew nothing about sports. And so it had to make sense to them. So, you were trained yeah. to make it work in a medium yeah. where it wasn't the, the standard. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Well, I look, loved it. Thank you for doing this. Love your work. Big fan and, and look forward to more. So thanks Thank for taking so the time, man. Take care. Talk to you soon. Thanks, John, for coming on. Thank you, everyone, for listening. The doc is on Netflix. It's the Redeem Team. If you love basketball, you're watching it no matter what. If you don't, you should check it out because it's about a lot more than just basketball. And these people are just great at making documentaries, these people being John and his awesome team and Netflix. Be sure to go to nofilmschool.com for all kinds of stories on filmmaking technology, education, and news. Subscribe to our newsletter in case there's stuff you miss, but you won't miss anything because you're going to be refreshing the homepage constantly, right? Uh, follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, check us out on Instagram. Obviously, this is up on YouTube. Please like, rate, and subscribe to the channel so you'll get alerts when we have new stuff going up. Our podcast is now going to be on YouTube, as well as all the other places you get podcasts. So if you aren't subscribed to the podcast, please do that as well. And if you're feeling generous, leave a comment and a rating on the podcast platforms because that's great for our show. And honestly, we love hearing from you. So be it through comments, be it something that's, shall we say, constructive criticism, or if it's just how much you like it, let us know. Or email us, editor at nofilmschool.com. We love hearing from the community. We love adjusting to all the things that you have to say and you'd like us to 
address and adjust to. And thanks so much for listening and watching.